Welcome to the Adventist Healthcare and You podcast. I'm Shanna. And I'm Nimit. Welcome to our listeners. We are back with our next episode and we are with Dr. Kasha Ferozvi. He's the medical director of Adventist Healthcare's Cancer Services. Welcome, Dr. Ferozvi. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's Thank a pleasure you. to be here. Thank you. And you are based at the White Oak Cancer Center, and you're also with Maryland Oncology Hematology, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, we're here to talk about what you may not know about cancer. You're an oncologist. Yes. And so we're here to bust some myths, talk about what you may not know, get some tips. So we're excited to have you. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting to have you. So why don't you start off with telling us about your specialty and, and why you chose your specialty? Sure. It's, uh, it's, you know, oncology is a really unique specialty. And I think every doctor who likes what they do will will be biased and say that their specialty is the best. Yeah. But I think I can honestly say my specialty is the best. And uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> being, I'm joking. I'm sure my cardiology friends and all my other <laughs> special, so specialist friends would, would uh, disagree. But I will say that my journey to oncology reflects what is unique about oncology and why people go into it, I think. Um, when I started medicine or medical school, I came to it from a, a perspective of seeing my father, who's an internist, develop these great relationships with patients over the years and, and building that, that longitudinal history and that longitudinal journey with patients where they built this, mm -hmm. not just this relationship, but a friendship over time. And I used to go with him on house calls and, um, and shadow him in clinic. And I, I saw that and was really impressed with that relationship um, and that um, opportunity to really help people in a meaningful way. And so I thought going into medicine, that's what I was going to do. I planned on it. But what ended up happening was I really fell in love with ICU medicine and taking care of life and death situations and being able to really help people at their worst moments where every decision you make um, has the potential to to impact someone's life in a, in a you know in a traumatic way. But what I lacked in ICU medicine was the ability to connect with patients because oftentimes they were intubated. As soon as they started to engage with you, they were sent off to the floor. And so you never really had that relationship. So I, I enjoyed that aspect. I enjoyed the aspect of primary care, but I didn't really, I, I missed the, the intensity of ICU when I was doing primary care. I remember I had a patient who um, got diagnosed with lung cancer when I was a third year medical student. And I I was the, uh, the student rotating with her, and I sort of developed this this um, bond with her, watched her get diagnosed, watched her get transferred to the ICU, then helped her as she and her family sort of grappled with decisions on what to do related to their diagnosis and treatment, and then helped her even make end-of-life decisions um, because her disease was pretty advanced, and then unfortunately, sadly, at the time, watched her pass. And so that experience made me realize I could blend what I liked about primary care, which mm -hmm. is this beautiful relationship, and what I liked about ICU medicine, which was dealing with life and death situations. And I could find that all in oncology. Couple that with the fact that oncology in many ways is, is truly the, on the cutting edge of, of science. Um, and a lot of the things that we do in oncology eventually make their way to other specialties. And so as somebody who enjoys and relishes the, the opportunity to learn um, at a fundamental basis of the pathophysiology of disease at the cellular level and understanding how the DNA impacts everything, oncology really um, embraces that mm -hmm. more than anything. And so, so that's why I chose oncology. I've been incredibly happy with it. I never expected this. It was not something that I intended to do, um, but you never know how, how life is going to take you in one direction. And so it's been, it's been an incredible journey. I will say oncology is, and cancer care in general, is something that is evolving really fast. Mm -hmm. And um, what I do today is so different from what I did just 20 years ago when I first started. Um, when I first started, you know, we diagnosed cancer based upon where it, where it originated from. You got a lung cancer, you got a breast cancer, you got a colon cancer, and we really stopped there. I mean, maybe we sometimes would go into, okay, lung cancer, you have adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. So there's a little bit of teasing out between the two different subtypes because we knew that the treatment sometimes varied based upon that. But ultimately, it was really just spending the time diagnosing a cancer based upon where it originated from. Mm -hmm. and, and truly, all of our diseases were tied to that, the diagnosis of the origin of the tumor. 
now it's so drastically different. Now we look at, you know, you, we can actually have a person who specializes in KRAS mutations, and it doesn't really matter where the cancer arises from. Could it be a breast cancer, a lung cancer, uh, a colon cancer, whatever it may be? And so we've, we've, our, sci- our knowledge of the science, our knowledge of the un- and understanding of the cellular basis of the disease has led us to regroup cancer in a way that's tied to the molecular basis and not necessarily the anatomic or histologic basis. And it has, has truly allowed us to be more effective in how we treat patients. It's allowed us to have less side effects and toxicities. Um, and it has really resulted in us being able to monumentally impact uh, the quality of life and the, the ability to basically take a disease which historically was terminal and it really turned it into a chronic disease. Um, and that's the paradigm shift that we're experiencing and it's tied to a true understanding of the molecular basis of the disease. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear a journey, you know, yeah. from why you chose oncology. And, and as, a, as a former ICU um, nurse, I could relate with, you know, building that relationship was was challenging at times. So we would, you know, spend a lot of time with family members, building a relationship with them too. Um, and, and as you said, when they got better, they would typically go to another floor. Um, but that intensity is is valuable as well. So, you know, having the best of both worlds for you um, and, and your passion towards is, is highly crucial for our patients. But I think also building that relationship with yeah. the patient. Um, I think that's been a trend in many of our, our podcasts too, where mm-hmm. uh, we are saying how vital that is for our patients to build that relationship with your physicians. You know, if, you, if you're if you unable to maybe try to figure out how to or maybe find another provider who's able to do that with you um, to to have that relationship for, for long term, you know, not just like few months or, or one year or so. And yeah, it's really I, become personalized. Yeah. You know, what you were describing too is, and, and maybe that's something where we can start with what people don't realize about cancer. And you might've already touched on it, which is it has become personalized. It doesn't look the same as what it did five years ago, 10 years ago. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, if you think about it, we talk a lot about personalized medicine because what we're doing now is we're taking patients and we're looking at their disease. We're looking at the DNA, the mutations that are the basis of their disease. And we're customizing and personalizing treatments that are targeted to those mutations and not sort of sort of giving a one size fits all approach, yeah. which is what we've historically done. But beyond that, at the dis- you know, that's the disease level. But when you take a step back and you look at the forest, not just the tree, and you see how do you as a patient interact with the health system mm-hmm. and how do we personalize that experience? Yeah. Because if you're just focusing, if all of our efforts are focused on personalizing our management of the disease, but we don't even look at the person and we don't understand how that disease and how the treatment that we're going to give for that disease impacts the entire person and their experience and their life and their family members and their work. And, and if you don't have the ability to have a conversation with your patient, with your, with your, your physician and your team um, to be able to get into that, uh, then it really undermines not only your ability to get good care, but the entire relationship. And, and I think, unfortunately, um, patients, when, especially with cancer diagnosis, are so scared um, and they're looking for somebody they Google, they see online and say, okay, this doctor goes, is from so-and-so institution. Um, I'm going to go there because I want the best. And they don't realize that they don't have to um, settle when it comes to a relationship because they might say, I'm going to go here. It's at such and such institution. And, you know, I don't have a great relationship, but that's okay because it's a such and such institution. That's all that matters. Um, and truly we're, we're, this disease is becoming a chronic disease, thank God. And if you're going to go through this journey with all the, the twists and turns and rocks and, and obstacles that you have to sort of navigate, and if you don't have a trusting relationship with your physician and your provider and your team that allows you to speak openly and transparently about all the issues that you have, you're going to be misled. Mm, and it's absolutely. not necessarily the physician's fault if they don't know all the things, but if yeah. they haven't created an environment where you can feel safe and comfortable talking it, it really could have more of a detriment than maybe having the quote unquote right treatment. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I, I completely agree with you and, and echo your, your point on that. Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned earlier was around um, toxicity or um, side effects for, mm-hmm. you know, tr- treatment. 
So, you know, when you think about cancer or when people do diagnose, get diagnosed with cancer, they're afraid of treatments, they're afraid of the side effects. What is the treatment like now and how, is, how has it changed over time? We used to spend a lot of time taking care of neutropenic fevers, okay? It was a common diagnosis. Patients came in because we blasted them with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy works by attacking rapidly dividing cells. I always tell my patients it works by attacking rapidly dividing cells, but it does so indiscriminately, and so there's a lot of collateral damage. There's a lot of bystander effect. And the result is any cell rapidly dividing, um, cancer-wise, um, obviously that's that's those are rapidly dividing cells, but there are other cells that are rapidly dividing, including hair, which is mm. mine's not as rapidly dividing as, <laughs> as, as you can tell, but, um, but especially stem cells, too, and sort of leads to the generation of your white blood cells, your red blood cells, and so on. So historically, when we used to give chemo, we used to knock out their bone marrow completely, wipe out their white blood cells such that they were walking around with, you know, increased propensity to infection in a meaningful way. And we didn't have a lot of supportive agents to support them through it. And so they would very commonly get hospitalized for neutropenia fevers, which are really Mm -hmm. life-threatening if they're not not addressed quickly. And during residency and fellowship, that was, we saw that all the time. Now I I teach, um, I have medical students who rotate with me and I ask them about their experience and they don't see a lot of neutropenia fevers. And, and that's part of you know, that, that experience from the student standpoint reflects what we're seeing at the macro level related mm-hmm. to the cancer experience and how we treat patients, to your point. Before we gave chemo, it attacked all rapidly dividing cells and you had a lot of side effects. Yeah. Now we're giving sort of, you could think of it as like a smart bomb. You know, we're targeted. Giving, yeah. we're targeted. Giving targeted therapies yeah. that are like missiles with GPS um, loaded into it, so that it can find its target and deliver its its sort of the wow. uh, yeah. the weapon directly to the the cells. And you don't have to go to, as you were saying, you don't have to go to top institutions to get that very customized, personalized, targeted treatment. It's available you know, right next door these days because yeah, it's it, the common treatment. Yeah, it truly is. It's it's available everywhere. And so what we're doing now in terms of how we approach patients is, just to give you an example, we used to take 100 women with breast cancer who had a two centimeter or higher tumor and say, okay, you need chemotherapy, knowing that we'd only benefit five to seven of them maybe. And so 90 plus patients who got chemotherapy were getting it with no real benefit. And there's one to 2% risk of heart failure. There's one to 2% risk, one plus percent risk of developing leukemia. So you're giving all this chemo for a benefit that's not really necessarily there, but it's more of an insurance policy. That's what we historically did. Now what we do is we take those 100 women, instead of treating 100 women with chemotherapy, we test 100 women and and look at the tumor and do the molecular profiling mm-hmm. of the tumor and, and understand the prognostic basis of the, the mutations and the genes that that make up that tumor that can then predict whether or not this patient's going to benefit from chemo or not. And not only that, which drugs might work better. And the result is we're not treating 100 women with chemotherapy. We're treating only the five to seven who may actually need it. That's yeah. great. And the remainder 90 would have a good quality of life at least. Yeah, yeah. so a lot of yeah. people are not getting chemo that don't need it anymore. And the ones who are getting treatment, they're getting more precise, more personalized treatment that has a higher chance of working. And that is, again, going back to what we said earlier, it's based upon the fact that we understand the basis of the disease. And so every patient nowadays who comes and sees us is getting what we call a molecular profiling analysis of their tumor. And they're, in essence, sending that off. We're getting all those mutations back, and we're understanding the basis of the disease, and we're targeting our therapy accordingly. And that's done readily now as a standard of care for for patients with cancer. That's nice. So we we talk about, we talked a lot about on this podcast over the many episodes we've had about the importance of screenings and what those recommendations are. And we don't really talk about much farther than that, or we haven't yet. And so Dr. Frozy, can you give us maybe some myths out there about the treatment process or about what it's like to go through or some common questions you get or myths we can kind of dispel? Yeah. So, I mean, there's typically there's three sort of modalities to treatment for the most part, three traditional modalities of treatment. One is your surgery. Mm -hmm. And I I tell my patients, I define them in your sort of localized treatment and systemic treatment. So localized treatment is treatment that's localized to that specific spot. So that would be your surgery and your radiation. And those are treatments that are going to address the tumor where it, where it is. And then systemic therapy is treatment that is in, in essence goes into your bloodstream and attacks the cells wherever they may be. And those cells that get out are the ones that eventually come back and cause problems. Mm-hmm. And so that's what systemic therapy does. And so that's kind of at a high level, the, the way we approach patients and the way we treat patients. But but you're right, there are a lot of myths in terms of what to expect. I mean, if you, many people remember that, what was that 
What was that movie with um, Ryan O'Neill? Dying Young. Dying, I was yeah, thinking thank, of thank that you. when you were talking about <laughs> the, you know, there's this picture people get of the side effects yeah. and, and all of Everyone that. Everyone remembers that. Movie. Yes. Everyone remembers like, uh, you know, Ryan O'Neill sort of having to, you know, take care of his, his wife who was throwing up and or miserable. she was oh, taking care of him. She was taking care of, sorry, sorry, taking care of him. Yeah, so, but he was throwing, uh, thank you. Thank yeah. You, me, but so. he was very sick. He was very and, sick and he was like throwing up uh-huh. and, and, and so people sort of come to me with those, those sort of historical, you know, memories, memories, <laughs> uh, this uh, sort or of perception. collective, perception. Perception. Yeah. collective, yeah, for sure. collective yeah. unconscious of, of, of the entire yeah. country um, who remembers that this is what, you know, I saw on TV. This is what my I remember growing up. My the cancer didn't kill the kill the you know my mm-hmm. aunt. It was the treatment that killed my aunt. And so people come with that that bias when they come to see me. And I have to spend a lot of time, unfortunately, uh, sort of saying, "Look, things are very different." And mm-hmm. it's not just the chemo and the treatments that are different. It's the supportive agents yes. that we give. Yeah. You know, you know, I can't emphasize enough. A lot of the drugs, a lot of the chemotherapies, we still give them, even though we're moving away from chemotherapy, moving more towards targeted therapies, immunotherapies, biologic therapies. But and when we do give chemotherapy, we're, you know, what we have found is that not only are we finding better chemotherapies, but we're able to help support patients through with drugs that help with nausea, drugs that help with, you know, growth factor support. Nutrition so therapy. Nutrition just, therapy. Just, Working through the nutrition. And, and understanding the, imp- the importance and value of nutrition, which mm-hmm. we historically didn't always know. Mm-hmm. And so um, we're able to help support people through their treatment in a way that we haven't historically been able to, not to mention the fact that we are getting more targeted, personalized therapy so that those side effects are, are markedly better. So I think, you know, I always tell patients now that, um, I w- you know, for patients who have early stage disease, I say we have the ability to really potentially cure this. And so we should really do whatever we can and be smart about it and take the time to think through this and come up with the right treatment plan so we can cure you. And for patients where we may not be able to cure because the disease is more advanced, say, how do we make this disease a chronic disease Mm -hmm. and one where you can live with it and not die from it? Yeah. And I I can't tell you how many patients I have who are working full time with advanced stage disease or 10, 15, 20 years out stage four disease. And you would never know. You would never know um, that they're dealing with this because they've been able to sort of figure out a way to get through treatment and get through life whereby the treatment is sort of helping control their disease, but they're not really debilitated and Mm -hmm. completely compromised by the treatment or the disease itself. What is exciting that's coming in in cancer treatment? You know, I I alluded to this a little bit earlier, Mm -hmm. which was the... Uh, understanding the molecular basis of the disease and then figuring out ways to target therapies that are tied to that. Uh, Just to give you an example, one of the first diseases where we sort of made that paradigm shift from a, you know, one size fits all to a more targeted personalized approach was the disease CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, where we could understand that there's this BCRA mutation. And if we can target it with a drug that can actually go to the the cell level and under, and sort of, treat the, the basis of that, we can make a significant difference. And so patients with CML, they were, the only way you could cure them was to go through a bone marrow transplant. And, and it was not an easy disease to manage. Suddenly you take a pill and at the time, take it for the rest of your life and you could be either cured or managed to now where we can say, you know what, maybe after a few years we can stop taking it mm-hmm. because wow. it's working so well. So that, that one disease is an example of what we're doing across so many different diseases and cancer. And so we have, A, the targeted therapies based upon these mutations. We have immunotherapy, which is a whole new area that is truly changing things. So, you know, you've talked a lot about the treatment and about some of the supportive care that's now part of it. And all of this we offer at Adventist Healthcare and our cancer centers. So what is special about what we do here? So I, I think there's a lot of things that we do that's really special. First of all, we have two great cancer centers that are right here in the community. We have the Aquilino Cancer Center and the White Oak Cancer Center. And both centers literally have everything that mm-hmm. patient would need, you know, in one roof. You, know, you can get your imaging studies. You can get your surgical consultations. You can get your radiation consultations. You can get your medical oncology treatments. You can see a dietitian. You can see a social worker. You can see a physical therapist. You can see a psychologist. You can get audiology testing. I can, I would argue to say that there's really not a lot of places where you can get all of these treatments in one roof at mm-hmm. one place that's coordinated and managed effectively together with all the providers communicating with one another, talking to one another. Uh, for example, I, I, we have at our facility, and same thing at both at Aquilina and White Oak, 
this occurs at both places. But um, what we do is we schedule our treat our, our patients who come in with breast cancer. They see the breast surgeon, the radiation oncologist, and the medical oncologist on the same day. Mm-hmm. And then oh, on top really of that, good. they when they come in for follow ups, we schedule the breast sur- surgery consult breast surgery follow up visit with the medical oncology visit the same day. So we always group them together. So my patient will see there's depending on who's available, either the surgeon first, then me, or me first and the surgeon, and they get it all done at one time, which just makes tremendous difference in terms of the experience. You don't have to take off two days of work. You, mm-hmm. you know, you can get everything done right away. You, you know, you, you know, you're parking one time and you're, you know, it's, it's a big difference. You know, again, patients are living with this disease now and living a normal life. And we want to try to find ways to make that and preserve it. Yeah, yeah. We want to make that inconvenience as little as possible. And so I, I've said earlier and I've said it again, I think the most important thing to a patient with cancer is time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if we can do whatever we can as an organization and as a health system, as a cancer center to safeguard that time, both in terms of what a patient can expect in terms of their life expectancy and time uh, here with their family, but also in terms of their time going from appointment to appointment. That ability to make the experience more efficient, but also make it more meaningful Mm -hmm. um, because you've got access to everything truly changes the overall uh, opportunity for a patient to not only do well, but to thrive to, to thrive while mm-hmm. they're dealing with a really unbelievable, difficult situation. So I, I think that is something that is unique that both of our centers provide, not to mention that. Um, we have um, at both facilities some of the most advanced uh, radiation treatments. Our, our centers are equipped with the most advanced radiation center, uh, most advanced radiation treatments in this, in this, in this area. Um, we're providing, I'll give you an example, one of our radiation centers at White Oak, we are able to provide um, treat, stereotactic treatment to brain metastases. Patients are now living, you know, with advanced disease for a long time. It used to be that you get brain metastases. My textbooks would say your life expectancy is less than six months, right? That's what I grew up learning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, forget about it. Now, we have situations where historically we would give whole brain radiation. We would treat the entire brain because, you know, we, we had no other way of controlling the disease, now what we can do is we can just give radiation to those specific spots because we have treatments that can get into the brain and, and take care of whatever microscopic disease is there. And we can preserve the brain function so that patients can live and function more effectively. And so we're able to provide stereotactic radiation to those brain lesions. Not you know, A lot of facilities, you can only do one at a time. We can do 10, 12 at a time minimizing the inconvenience for patients so that they can just come once and get it done and not have to make repeated trips yeah. over and over again. So that's just one example. We have we have access to over about 100 clinical trials. So for patients who want to get access to new drugs and new treatments, we have access at both facilities to, to those um, new trials, new treatment. Um, we are in the process of opening up our own molecular testing lab. So right now, one of the, the, the problems we have that as an as a oncology community is that, you know, I talked a lot about the molecular mutation testing and how that information can drive treatment decisions. Mm-hmm. The problem is from the time the patient gets the, uh, the biopsy to the time that information comes back, it can be four to six weeks sometimes. Oh, wow. And during that time, the patient has to start treatment. So sometimes in our guidelines, we actually have in, in, in our national guidelines recommendations to say when you don't have the information because it's not available, treat with treatment X. And once the mutation analysis comes back, pivot to treatment Y. We're building into our guidelines that inefficiency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what we're doing now, because we've, as an organization, we've grown and we, we see so many patients with, um, with cancer, we're going to be building our own testing in-house so that we can get that turnaround time from four to six weeks sometimes to less than two weeks, less, I mean, less than five to seven days sometimes. And so that will allow us to have the information when a patient needs is re- yeah. to, to make a decision. And we're not sort of um, having them to, to wait. Right now, this is a, this is a nature of, of oncology, which is that it takes a long time to get those results. And so we'll be having that very soon. That's, I think that's just going to add value to the one-stop yep. shop experience that Absolutely. our patients are already having. Yep. So, Absolutely. You know. yep. Getting them the care they need faster and personal and even more personalized. So Yeah, when it comes to cancer, people, when they get diagnosed, the cancer was, they need treatment yesterday. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and so we have to spend time making sure patients understand while we do want to move as fast as we can, we also want to be smart about it. 
And sometimes a little bit of waiting to get the right information is appropriate better, so that yeah. we don't make the wrong decision. But at the same time, we also want to move as efficiently as, uh, as possible. So by having these two centers that we have here right in Montgomery County, where we've made that experience and that, uh, you know, incredibly difficult time a little bit more manageable. That's good. I want to ask you about a, a, a passion of yours or an area of focus of yours, and that is older adults with cancer and the focus on some of those unique needs. What are some of those unique needs in older adults? You know, when we look at clinical trials, that's a great question. And I'll just sort of, um, I'll come back to that. I'm, yep. I, don't mind, I, I don't want to sound like I'm going off on a tangent, but when we look at clinical trials and those cl- the clinical trials that are done that are the basis of how we come up with guidelines are oftentimes skewed because they are clinical trials with the ideal patient population. Mm. Patients who are as, as, as disease free or as comorbidity free as possible so that, you know, they are eligible for clinical trials because clinical trials are really strict about making yeah. sure that you you have to have good liver functions, you have to have good kidney functions, you, have, you can't have a lot of comorbidities and things like that. So, so we really filter out patients, real world patients who mm. may have a lot of issues. And we, we only get those patients who are, we're going to, you know, not compromise the effectiveness of the treatment um, for this clinical trial potentially. And so that's, that's the reality, unfortunately. And so the real world is that people have a lot of conditions and, you know, our studies um, sometimes miss the fact that we have patients who are octogenarians and living into the nineties and hundreds. And, 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 you know, so how do we take these treatments and these guidelines and just sort of blindly apply them to people where it may not make the most sense and the treatments may actually bring a lot of toxicity because we haven't taken into consideration all the other comorbidities. And that really exists and, and then some with our, with our elderly patient population mm-hmm. where, you know, we already know that this patient population is oftentimes taking a lot of medications. Mm-hmm. Okay. And polypharmacy can become a real issue. There's a study that came out of University of Oklahoma years ago that showed that the average cancer patient around the time of their treatment is taking on average nine drugs. Oh, wow. Okay. Think about all the potential drug, drug interactions that you can potentially see. And side effects. And side effects. And so, so that's, you know, and then you apply that to our, our senior population who are already you know, largely taking a large number of medications and throw into that treatments that have real side effects without really paying attention to how this impacts them. It can be truly harmful. Um, the second thing is we oftentimes don't look at, you know, when a patient comes to see me, they're sitting in a chair. I walk in, they're sitting in a chair mm. and I leave, they're still sitting in the chair. And you know, I, I don't know how they're walking. I don't know, you know, how, you know, agile they are. I don't know what their fall risk is because my experience with them is I go in, they're sitting in a chair. I leave, they're sitting in a chair. Maybe I do a telehealth visit, see their face, but I don't see them walking. I mean, I don't see all the, and, and how the treatments that I give can impact them in terms of fall risk, in terms of, you know, really compromise, causing so, so such severe neuropathy that they can't walk anymore, yeah. that they're, they're, they're miserable. And so our, our senior population is a patient population that we cannot take a one size fits all. And we cannot avoid the fact that we have to look at every aspect of what they're going through, their functional status, their ability to walk, their nutrition status, their pharma, you know, how many drugs they're taking, mm-hmm. all of that. And that takes a lot of time. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. And in, in, in the clinic these days, we don't, we don't really sometimes spend that time to really dissect this more nuanced approach to apply our treatments to patients who, who have a lot more comorbidities and more issues. And so I think there's a real opportunity. One of the things we really want to do here is um, build a program around um, focusing on our, our senior population and making sure that we can provide a more customized approach. We've talked a lot today about personalized medicine. Yeah. And we this have is to, even more this personalized. This is even more yeah. personalized um, because it's not just the patient that you have to take care of. You have to take care of all of their medical issues, all their polypharmacies, co- you know, coordinate with all of their other doctors, cardiologists, their pulmonologists, their nephrologists, their primary care doctor. Uh, and you have to be able to make sure that their family is looped in. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there's a difference between a, a 40-year-old young uh, woman with breast cancer um, compared to an 87-year-old who maybe lives alone but has five family, five 
children who are taking shifts every day to sort of provide food for them. Um, it's a very different situation. You really have to do a lot more care coordination with, you know, our, our senior patient population that oftentimes, again, is not done as much as we'd like to. So we're trying to build a, a center that focuses on this where we can make sure that patients get that more customized approach. Um, and we're, we're excited to, to get that moving and um, we're in the process of building those pieces out. Well, there's some exciting things happening here at our uh, Adventist Healthcare's Cancer Centers, Aquilino Cancer Center and White Oak Cancer Center. Absolutely. So, so we ask all our speakers, you know, with the one tip for a healthy living that you would recommend to our listeners, you know, if, if they had one thing they want to get out of this, what would that be? When it comes to cancer care, I'd say um, the one thing. Yeah, it's, hard to, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing. I, can I ask Liberty for two things? Sure. You sure can. <laughs> okay, so two things would be, number one, prevention is the best medicine. Yeah. So as great and as exciting as it is to have all these new treatments that we can help patients who are diagnosed with cancer, the best treatment for cancer is to never get it. No. Um, and so, or if you do get it, get it really early. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> so I would say, you know, a healthy diet and exercise, I can't emphasize that enough. I think we're learning more and more how that impacts and how that prevents um, so many, so many medical conditions, including cancer. So I, I, I can't, have, it sounds very cliche and, but it, it but you it's know, sometimes true. the, the, sometimes yeah. the yeah. most yeah. simple things are the truest. Yeah. And so, and get those mammograms, and get the mammograms, get your colonoscopy, um, skin checks, skin checks. And, and you know, what's going to be really cool is going to cutting edge medicine is there's a time coming. It's not here yet where you're going to get a blood test. That's going to look and measure circulating free DNA which can identify, I think it's 60 or 47 cancers. Mm. Wow. So we're going to have a time in, there, in our lifetimes, very soon, I think, where your primary care doctor is going to be probably doing something like an annual circulating free DNA screening test for 47 cancers. So that will be a total game changer. That is fascinating. Yeah. Which, yeah. again, emphasizes why you need a primary care physician yep. Absolutely. and you need to have your annual checkup. <laughs> and I, I don't want your listeners to go run to the primary care doctor saying, why can I get this test? No, because it's not it's prime not, time it's yet. Not, so it's I, not I available yet. That. It's, so it's not available yet. But, but I mean, the mammograms and the colonoscopies, the mammograms, colonoscopies, all of those are. All so. of those are. So that, I'd say, is the, the most important thing. Yeah. The second thing I would say is to, when you do get, if God forbid someone does get diagnosed with cancer, um, to find a good place where you can feel comfortable and to be your own advocate and make sure that you're really owning your care as much as you can, but also trusting your providers because um, when there's not trust, then it really does create a, a difficult um, experience for you. I mean, patients, I, I really love the patient empowerment that, that sort of we've seen in healthcare mm -hmm. um, with all of this access to information but at the end of the day, you still have to have a doctor who's spent time, years studying this, to who you can trust to decipher fact from fiction, a lot of the misinformation out there. So, and who listens to who you? Who listens to you? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, be your advocate, but also find that trusting relationship. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Frizzy. This is great information. Thank um, you. Thank you for being here. If you would like to find Dr. Ferrizvi, you can visit AdventistHealthcare.com. Click on Find a Doctor. You can also find them with uh, Maryland Oncology Hematology. To learn more about cancer services at Adventist Healthcare, you can also visit AdventistHealthcare.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast so you can get all of our new episodes. Thank you to our listeners and be well. Be well.